Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for tonight's Bible study, Lord. We pray, Father God, that today, Lord, everything that we talk, everything we learn today, that you be glorified, Lord, that you teach us your word, your customs, your things, Father God, to follow your ways, Lord, that we don't mix up your word with our own ideas, with what we want it to say, what we don't think it should say, Holy Spirit. Help us to have humility, to be teachable, Lord, that as every time we read your word, Lord, that we go into it just to learn what you like, Father God, to fall more in love with you, Lord. And whatever you require of us, God, help us to do that, Lord. In the moments where we come up short, in the moments where we fail, Father God, help us to be reminded that you're there to help us get back up, Lord. For whoever is on here and they're struggling with something, Father God, help them to be reminded that you're there to help them to get back up, Lord. Father God, it's not about how many times we get knocked down, but it's how many times we're going to keep getting back up, Lord. So whatever it is we may be going through, Lord, help us in this night to keep getting back up, Father. And let this word feed us, strengthen us, Father God, encourage us. Let it burn a new fire within us, Holy Spirit, so we can keep serving you and, Father, living a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, so it's pretty interesting, this chapter. If you read it, there's some things in there you're going to be like, what? Uh, but <laughs> we don't get to cherry pick scriptures. How many could say amen? We don't get to pick the ones we like and the ones we don't like. You know, when I was a kid and I used to eat Lucky Charms, I will only eat the marshmallows and leave out the stuff I didn't like. Uh, we can't do that with the Bible, right? We have to um, believe all of it or, or you're not going to believe none of it. So... But it's so important because when you read the Bible, there's something called hermeneutics and stuff. There's a proper way to study the Word of God. And because a lot of people will, will will read a verse and read it out of context and take it so far. And that's how you get cults. This is how you get weird religions. This is how you get weird beliefs and stuff like that. Have you ever heard someone just teach something? It's like, man, it's like weird. And, and then it doesn't really match or fit with the rest of this, the Bible. Healthy doctrine is that we teach something and the rest of the Bible matches, right? Whatever it is that is being taught. So how do you get unhealthy or false doctrine? When you start to teach something that does not match the rest of the Bible. So if someone says, hey, the Bible says this and they make something up. Well, you can, if, the, if you can find another verse that contradicts what they're saying, then what they're saying is false. And uh, it's a false teaching. So that is why it's so important that the Bible says, study the word of God to show yourself approved. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not how great you sing, how, how good you cast demons out. It's about how much word of God do you know and apply and have the wisdom of the Lord. Because guys, without the word of God, you can do nothing. Uh, without the word of God, you don't even know what spirits are what. Without the word of God, you can't decipher or discern things. That's why it's so important. And this is why we study the Bible because not every time that there's a preaching or a teaching, it's always going to be about your situation. And I think a lot of people, they'll get bored when they go to church or a Bible study, because if they're not preaching something about their situation, which goes to show that they didn't really come for God, they came for themselves. You Sometimes you're going to go and you're going to hear things that has nothing to do with you. It's completely relevant to you. But but that's the, the word of God and learning the word of God is not about you. It's about him. It's about getting to know him more. It's about falling more in love with him, getting to know what he likes, what, what he expects. And as you do that, and as you grow in, in the knowledge of Christ, you're going to grow in grace and power and authority and all these different things. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. It says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Think about how bold that first verse is of the Apostle Paul. And other translations, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. You ever heard someone say, I don't follow man, right? I don't follow man. I only follow God. Well, if man is following Christ, you should follow man and follow man in the sense that if that man is following Christ, you should follow them. That's why there. And, and how do you know who to follow? That's why God has placed pastors and apostles and spiritual leaders for you to follow them. Because how many times you hear we, it sounds spiritual but it, it's not that smart. You know, it says, oh, I only follow God. I don't follow a man. Well, you know, you, you should follow the man that follows God. That's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ or imitate me as I imitate Christ. Why? Because he was showing you, hey, think about it. You got <laughs> how many of us could be could be honest? How 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 confident are you in your relationship with God that you could tell somebody copy my lifestyle? That's what he's saying. Imitate me as I, I imitate Christ. 
How many could be say uh, uh, you could tell people around you imitate my life? Most of you be like, no, 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 don't imitate my life. Don't do what I do. Don't speak the way. If you told people, hey, speak how I speak, what, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? If you people say react or respond or do what I do, I think about that. So if you have, to, if so, if you told somebody, no, 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 don't, don't, don't imitate me, don't copy me. Well, then that means you're not, you yourself are not really imitating Christ. Because if you're imitating Christ, people should be able to imitate you. If you're copying Christ, then people should be able to copy you. If you're following Christ, people should be able to follow you. But if you're not sure about people following you or doing the things you do, then that means you probably have something there that is not pleasing to God that you you got to surrender it. Amen. Uh, so now Paul's going to go here in verse two, uh, talking about head coverings. How many ever seen people cover their head or wear like something on their head, specifically women, uh, when they pray, uh, they'll, 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 they'll wear the little... I don't want to be disrespectful, but they wear the little rag on their head, or 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 you see, obviously in Jewish culture, you'll see um the men wear the little hat that has a name. It starts with thing with a K. Um, probably Justin that's on here. It's, I forgot what it's called. It yeah, was, like a. So um. So there's a lot of these things, right? And 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 it's crazy because Paul talks about this, but that did not exist yet. The kippah, yep. It, it did not exist in the time that Paul was talking about it. But nonetheless, you still had people who 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 did these things because there was other people who worshipped false gods, there were other people who worshipped in false things. So a lot of things in the scripture were always to separate the church from the world, from other customs. So we're going to learn about coverings, spiritual coverings. And and this is a, a, a really touchy uh, topic because... I've I've had people always ask me um before, hey brother, who's who's your church covering over Unity Church? And I've told them Jesus Christ is my covering, and that has not satisfied some people's answers. And I've told them I'll 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 get a a church covering, spiritual covering that you claim that I'm supposed to have when you can show me one verse in the Bible that tells me I'm supposed to have one. Well, reality is there is none that will tell you this. And this is why Paul breaks it down here. Verse two, he says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So now this is why it's so important to understand the Bible. What we're about to read, keep one thing in mind. When you read the Bible, there's things that are commandments. There's things that are requirements. There are things that are recommendations. And there's some things that are traditions. And the way do you know that is that he'll tell you, <laughs> he'll tell you, hey, this is a commandment. How many times when we we so far from we, we read from Paul, right? When we read Timothy before, now we're Corinthians, where he, where the apostle Paul say, this is a commandment from God, or this is a commandment from me, or this is what I recommend you should do. How many times have we seen that, right? Where Paul makes something clear, he'll say, this is a commandment from God. He'll say, this is what I think you should do. He goes, this is my um, recommendation. So when someone uses certain things, should we listen to all of those things? Absolutely. Are, are all of them are going to be a heaven and hell thing? No, only commandments are heaven and hell things. Everything else is something you should do, but it doesn't mean that if you don't do it, you're going to go to hell. And I know some Christians are going to go crazy. What? So you're saying there's verses that I don't have to do? No, it's not. I'm not saying that there's any verses that you're not supposed to do. These are things you should strive to fulfill anything, whether it's a requirement, a commandment, a recommendation. You should do your best to follow all of the Bible and the word of God. But not all the things that are mentioned there are going to send you to hell, right? So cuz if if Paul recommends you stay single and you don't stay single, does that mean you're going to go to hell? What do you guys think? Right? If the apostle Paul says, "Hey, I recommend you stay single," <laughs> and you don't stay single, does that mean you're going to go to hell? No, because it was not a commandment. It was a recommendation of his. So you have to understand what is called hermeneutics and all this stuff. That's why we've had I even had some people who used to go to church trying to argue things. I'm like, "You don't know proper hermeneutics. You don't you don't even know how to break down the Bible." That's how you come up with false doctrine. That's why it's so important before you try to become a teacher of the word of God, that you be a student and you learn the word of God. So you understand what you're saying, because if not, you can read something and you'll go crazy with something thinking you have a revelation from God. But what you really have is a revelation from the devil to condemn other Christians. Amen. He says here, now I praise or says that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. 
But before he goes in traditions, he says this, verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Does it say here that the head of man is another man? Does that does it say anywhere here and what we just read? Does it say that the that the covering of man is another man? No, it says that the he the head of every man is Jesus Christ, right? And it says, and the head of woman is man. Does it say that God has made woman to be the head? What do you guys think? Can a can a woman be the head? No. What happens if a woman does not have a man? <laughs> I just just testing you guys. Let's see. I want to see how spiritual our church is. What if the woman does not have a man? Who? What? Do, what does she do then? Amen. She submits to her pastor, but her head be, is Jesus Christ. So you got you got. You got Jesus Christ, you have man, a physical male. That's why it's important what Brenda said, submit to your pastor, amen? Because then that's the physical male that God has put to pastor you. Because if you don't have a pastor of the home, you still have the pastor of the church. So it's if, you, if you don't have a husband, uh, the pastor becomes the, the head over you. But, but, but regarding your entire life, the head is still Jesus Christ, amen? And so it says here, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Would it not be her father? No, because no scripture tells you that this that the head of a of a there's not one verse that tells you that the head of a woman is her father. It it it, it would not it would not be that because the the head of of everyone now of the household and now unless you're a child that's a different story you're in the same household. That's different. But if not, you're you're an adult. You don't have a man in your life. That That's who you're supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be in the order of God. But there's no scripture that tells you that a woman like that is, is the father is going to be this going to be the head. Amen. And it says here and uh, and every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So Paul's saying, if you pray or you're prophesying, it says here, and you have your head covered, that you're dishonoring your head. Who is the head of man? Jesus Christ. So he's saying, if you cover your head, you're dishonoring the Lord. Anybody have any idea why he's saying that? I'm going to tell you why. Because no man, because see, what we're about to read is both spiritual and a traditional aspect. If you notice when Paul starts off, what does he start off by clarifying uh, that what he's talking about? See, this is this is why you can't grab one thing and take it to a whole nother level because you're going to grab something out of context and you're going to come out of something. He starts off by saying, no, he, he mentions tradition, but he also mentions this. He's mentioned coverings. He's mentioning authorities. So he's talking spiritual things. He's saying the spiritual covering of a woman is her husband or, her, or her, the man in her life. And, 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 and if in the covering and the spiritual authority over man is Jesus Christ and over Jesus Christ is God, the father. So he's letting you know from the beginning, he's talking about spiritual things and also traditions. How do we know which ones? Well, he's going to talk about it. So that in that aspect, should men be wearing stuff on their head when praying or prophesying? Probably not. <laughs> but it's not for a religious uh, purpose. But it also can let you know that a man should not be doing things with the covering of another man, right? Because a head, if you, as we read later, he starts to say that 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 anyone who does this without or, or, or covering, and, and it later tells you it talks about a woman, which I'm going to break it down later for if it sounds confusing right now. He says that we shouldn't have these things, right? Verse four, every man praying or prophesying, having his head to cover this on. Okay, verse five. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is the one and the same as if her head were shaved. 
So if a woman is praying or prophesying, do you guys think she should be wearing that thing on her head? Yes or no? You guys think that a woman should be wearing that on her head if she's praying or prophesying? I know y'all are confused. <laughs> I'm a, so we're going to keep reading. Off of this verse alone, it's good. you would say yes. But keep reading, your answer is going to be no. And it says here, but everyone who prays prophesied with her head uncovered dishonors it, for that is the one that the same as if her head were shaved. So keep that in mind. He's, he, he, he talks about a covering, but now he's talking about you might as well have your head shaved. So now is he, is he talking about covering or hair? So let's keep reading. Verse 6, for, a, for if a woman is not covered... Let her also be shorn, for it, but it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved. Let her be covered. Remember that word, covered. For a man indeed ought to not cover his head, since he is in the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. So, so once again, this is why this is why it's so important when we study scripture, you gotta pay attention to all the little words he's saying. So he says, for a man need not to doesn't doesn't need to cover his head, right? Because he's made in the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Did it say woman is the glory of God? No, nah, it says woman is the glory of man. So if a woman if is the glory of man and she is not covered by her man, she's shaming herself. So is it really talking about something on your head? No, it's talking about a man. If a woman is doing ministry, if a woman is prophesying and praying and she's not covered by the one who is you're supposed to be the glory of man and that man is not there to cover you, you're shaming yourself. So this is talking about men. So and how do we know this? Because Paul starts off telling you who is the authority or the head or the covering over woman. He says the husband is and the, the head and the covering of the husband is Jesus and God. And he's telling you the order. So clearly from the beginning, he's not, he's talking about, he's talking about spiritual. So a woman shouldn't, that's why a woman. And, and how do we know this? This talking about spiritual because we read Timothy. You guys remember it in Timothy where he talks about submitting to authority that a woman's not supposed to exercise authority over men. Why? Because she doesn't have authority on her own. She has, her, but a woman gets her authority by her submission to, to God. For example, Pastor Crystal has authority because she is submitted under my covering as her husband. She operates in the authority that I, God has given me. And because the two have become one, we're one together. So when my wife prays or she prophesies or does things, she's not operating under her own authority. She's under she's operating under the covering that I have over her as her head. And I we have that together because I'm submitted to God and I'm covered by God and he's my covering. You guys understand what I'm saying? So when people say, well, does that mean that a woman can't do anything? No, it means that a woman is supposed to have submission to her husband. And I know a lot of women don't like these verses will say, oh, submission to man. Well, that's why you should marry a spiritual man. That is not an issue for you to submit to a spiritual man and, and a, a godly man. Because if you ask, I ask my wife, is do you think she has issues submitting to me? No. Why? Because I don't submit, I don't even submit to myself. I submit to Jesus Christ. If you have a woman who does not want to submit to you, doesn't want to follow you, wants to do her own thing, wants to control you, wants to dictate you, then you no longer have a submissive woman. You have a Jezebel. A, a woman with a Jezebel spirit wants to control a man, doesn't like submitting to man. A man tells her, to, hey, this is what we're supposed to do, and they always want to come back with something else. That that shows you have a, a Jezebel spirit, and and you need to you need to you need to have you need to have the Holy Spirit in you to say, look, I submit to man. But what if he's wrong? What if he's off? Let God deal with him, right? 
but you have a lot of women and especially in this culture i did a video about it on the olympics women wanting to be men women wanting to control their man i i see it so much guys so so much a woman controls how the man talks what he wears how what he does all these different things those are not signs of a submissive woman and if you were that kind of woman in bible days you would not get married you, no, no man would would end up marrying you because you show signs of not being submissive and vice versa women don't want to marry a man a man who's not submitted to god right because if he's not submitted to god why should she submit to him so it's so important so he's talking about here that a woman who's doing anything and doesn't have a man as as the covering as her head she's shaming herself right and how do we know this it says here for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So this is not talking about specifically uh, of, of a clothing because he once again brings up about your head being covered, but then he talks about male and female and the, and the roles, gender roles. This is why it's so important. Now you guys understand why we live in a world and a culture that wants to get rid of genders and gender roles. This is an antichrist spirit that is moving in the world to get rid of genders. You notice that people, they, they, this is why this is of the devil because it wants to get rid of gender roles. And because you think about it, if you're a lady, right. And, and you're with your, your man and, and, and your, your tires pop on the highway, who should be getting out of the car and putting the spare tire. It should be the man that's getting out of the car and putting the spare tire. If you're a man and you sit in the car and the woman gets out and puts the, the spare tire, you're an Ahab and she's a Jezebel. <laughs> it should not, it should not be this way. And vice versa. It, it, you should it, it should it should be it should be the other things with other things. Those are called gender roles. That is why it is so important. The woman submits and the man leads. The man's not leading because he does whatever he wants to do, but the man is accountable to God. You notice when Adam and Eve messed up, who did God want to go confront? He didn't go confront Eve. He went and confronted Adam. That is why Adam ended up having to, his Bible says there that, that his punishment was that the sweat up off his brow, he would be have to provide for his family. That's us because us as men today, we have that we have that consequence now because of Adam that off the sweat of our brow, we should provide for our family. Now, if you have a man who is not the provider of the home and the woman is the provider of the home, I'm sorry if you're the male and the woman is the provider of the home, you are the Eve of the home. You are not the Adam. She is the Adam. And it goes to show your house is not in order. It goes to show that 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 these things are, are not right. And that when, when things are not right in the home, nothing else goes right. The kids don't go right. The finances don't go right. Nothing goes right. And, and, and Can you guys please all make sure you keep your stuff muted? Thank you. Um, so it, it's so important so that we understand gender roles. Why? Like I said, because the world wants to eliminate gender roles because they, so anybody can just do whatever they want. No, God has programmed women to do things that only women can do. And God has programmed men to do things only men could be doing. If I was in the street and somebody said something disrespectful, my wife should not be jumping in front of me to defend the family. I'm the man. I should be the one defending the family. That is why God made gender roles. That's why God made man to be physically stronger than woman. <laughs> it would be embarrassing if someone does something to my kid and it's my wife throwing punches and I'm just sitting there going, no, babe, don't do it. That just <laughs> it would, it would not be right. That's why there's gender roles and there's different things. So he's saying here, if you're a woman, you're going to be doing these things, then you need to have, you need to be submitted to authority and the head over you is, 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 is your husband. But this is important. It says here, verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. It says, For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Meaning that men should never feel superior to woman. At the end of the day, man came first, but you came from woman. And that's what Paul is saying. You're not independent of these things. So it's not for man to say, I'm the leader, I'm the pastor of the home, and you're a macho man controlling everything and you're manipulative. That's not of God either, because I know men who abuse the scriptures 
to say, well, I'm the pastor. Well, I'm the home and I'm the leader. I'm sorry, but if you're the man of the home and you have to say those things, you're not the man of the home. You don't need to say what you are. You need to demonstrate who you are. How many can say amen? How many ladies can say amen to that? You should not have to state your position. If you were being who you were supposed to be, you would never have to say who you are. Right. If you're always constantly saying, well, I'm the pastor of this home and, and well, I'm the leader of this home, then I'm your, you're not respected. You think your boss has to remind you that he's your boss? Nah, one one as soon as he walks in that office, as soon as he walks in that job, you you, you know it's business. Why? Because he, you, you got to respect the position. If he has to start saying who he is <laughs> every time he shows up to work, that means there's no respect there. That means you're not being um what you're supposed to be. I'm a grown man. Don't tell me what to do. So if men, if you had to find yourself having to say those things, uh, you better question why, why are you not respected? Are you really being, are you saying you're this man? Because reality is a lot of men say that they're the pastor. Or I'm the leader, but you're not really a leader. And the reason why women can't submit to you is because you don't, you don't show signs of someone that follows God in order to be a good leader of a family. You must be a good follower of Christ. Ladies, do not choose to be with a man to lead you when he doesn't even know how to follow Christ. You can't lead if you don't know how to follow. That's why anyone who's going to be a leader in the church, you must be a follower of Jesus. You must be a follower of your pastor. You must be a follower of whoever is your, your spiritual authority in your life. If you can't follow, you can't lead. Amen? Yeah. Let's keep reading. And it says here... Um, Verse 13, judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a, if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? So that's another thing. Should men have long hair? No, men should not have long hair. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear. This is no longer talking about uh, spiritual things. It's talking about, sorry, Jason, but it says here, Verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. Why? Because it doesn't look good, right? <laughs> a man should look like a man and a female should look like a female. Verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. So when woman, if a, when other woman tells you, why are you praying or prophesying without a, a covering? You should tell them, I have two. I have my, my, my husband, who is my spiritual covering, and God gave me hair to be my covering. <laughs> so when people think that it's talking about putting something on your head, that's not what it's talking about. And when it talks about a man having something on their head, why is he telling you not to do that? Because you have that today now. You have it in the Jewish culture that when they pray, they put something on their head. And God is saying, that's not a sign of honor to God. Your honor to God is that you're submitted to your head, who is Jesus Christ, right? Because you can put that on, but if you're not submitted to Christ, your prayer, your worship means nothing. How many can say amen? You can wear the religious outfits, but if you're not really living your life for Jesus, if you're not really living a life submitted to Jesus, you're, it means nothing. Right. You you see it in multiple religions. You see it in the, the Jewish culture. You see even in the Catholic culture, the Pope wears something on his head. And, and, and the scripture tells you the opposite. You notice that that is why it's so important when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about customs and traditions. What does the Bible say? Why does the Pope wear something on his head when the scripture tells you you shouldn't wear something on your head when you're worshiping and praying? Right. Because that's not sign of a covering. Your sign is that you're submitted to Jesus Christ. And it says here that the covering of a woman also is her hair. I said, but if anyone seems to be contentious. <laughs> so Paul knows that if he's talking about these things, people are going to argue about it. People are going to be contentious and say no and this and that. And it says here we have no such custom nor do the churches of God. So it should not be a, a custom of ours to be arguing over things of the Bible. I have people who will try to argue things with me and, and Paul saying this, it shouldn't even be a custom of the church. You should apply what the word of God says and move on. You shouldn't be going back and forth about it. How many can say amen? Verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worst. <laughs> You got to remember, Paul's writing this to the Corinthians. He said, Man, every time you guys get together, some kind of drama is going on. So, 
So obviously the church here, he makes it clear that every time we should be getting together, it should be glorified. God it shouldn't be more trouble. And it says, first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. It says, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may recon may be recognized among you. Why? Because there's always somebody coming to the church to cause division. Amen. There's always going to be somebody that comes to the church to try to cause division in the church. That's why here at Unity Church, I don't allow that. I, I'm, I'm like the Apostle Paul. I'm a dog, man. You're not going to come to this church and cause drama. If you come here gossiping, starting drama, causing people to talk bad about any minister in our church or the pastor, that's what you guys should, the same way I have your guys back, you should have my back. If somebody comes to the church and says, hey, man, I don't like the pastor, man. I don't like what he taught and starts talking to you like that, bring them to me. If anyone comes to the church talking bad about your pastor, bring them before the pastor and vice versa. If any of you guys call me to ask me a talk to me about somebody else, I'm going to tell you, let's go talk to that person. There's no room to be talking bad about people because what you're going to do is you're going to cause division. You're going to cause people to leave the church. I've seen it for too long in the church and division. And Paul's saying this, but it says that people should recognize who's approved and who's not. That's why at our church, if you're a minister, you wear a badge. If you're not, if you're not wearing a badge in our church, you're not a minister because I want people to recognize who has proven themselves, who has been here long enough, who has been faithful here, who has shown humility? Who has been uh, been teachable? Who has shown that they can be rebuked and still stay there? Because most people, they get rebuked or corrected in church, they leave the church. So they've proven themselves that, hey, hey, they've been, said things to me I didn't like. I've been rebuked. I've been corrected, but I'm still standing. I'm still here. I'm still going to keep serving. It's so important. Guys, I, there's, I have a million stories of how many times my pastor rebuked me, corrected me, went off on me. I went off on him. <laughs> like... And I still stayed there. It shows signs that, you know, we have humility and that we're approved, right? And it says here, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So he's talking about uh, uh, when they're taking the Holy Supper. I say some people go there just to eat. Some people are like that with church. They only come to church just to eat. And some people come and it says they're drunk and all these different things. And he says, these are not good things. We shouldn't have this. Or it says people do these things. Verse 23, it says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and we had given things. He broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance in me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That's why we take the Holy Supper. We're not doing it uh, to, to wash you of your sins or some other well, you know weird reason. The reason why we take the Holy Supper, the Apostle Paul is saying, as we do that in remembrance of Jesus, that we remember that the wine symbolizes his blood was poured out for us. The bread represents that he's the bread of life and Jesus's body was broken. So, he, so we could eat from him and drink from him. Amen. And be satisfied in Christ. Verse 27, it says, therefore, whoever eats this bread, drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So when we're partaking of God, and this is not just only when we're taking the Holy Supper, when we're going to partake anything of God, you got to examine yourself. How many can say amen? That when you want things of God, because I notice this with Christians, they want blessings from God. They want God to touch them. They want God to speak to them. They want God to move in their life. Well, it says if you want to be partaking of God's body and of his blood, examine yourself. There's even another scripture that tells us, it says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Isn't that crazy that you're a Christian, you've accepted Jesus, you have those, and the scripture is still telling you, make sure that you examine yourself to see if you're still in the faith. Uh, I'm reading this in the New King James Version. So it's so important that we constantly 
that we are examining ourselves. Amen. You should go before God every day. I do this myself every morning and I'll say, Lord, you know, whatever's in me, whatever I may be doing wrong, Lord, forgive me. And, and at the end of my day, before I go to bed, I'm like, Lord, show me. Did I say anything? Did I do anything I wasn't supposed to? Did I react in ways I didn't supposed to? Lord, if there's anything I need to work on, show it to me and examine yourself. Think about yourself. Like, did you, when you did this or you did this, and if you did anything, you correct it. What happens is a lot of us is, well, I prayed, I read my Bible and I went to church, but you never examine yourself. See, a spiritual man and a humble person in Christ is constantly checking themselves constantly. I don't care how long you've been in the Lord. I don't care how long you think you are a good person. You must always go before God and say, God, is there anything I'm doing wrong that I can fix? Lord, is there anything I can do? That, that because reality is God, if you search, you'll find. <laughs> and I know I can get a big amen from the ladies. If you grab his phone, you're going to find something. Which If he's a man of God, you shouldn't find anything. But if you search for problems, if you're looking for something wrong, you're going to find it. So if you want to look for something wrong, look for it in yourself. If you're coming to church, look, you know how many times I've met people that have come to our church or go to other churches? Oh, I don't like that church. And I don't like how he does altar calls. And why does everybody have to come up And this? You find everything wrong with church, but you never find what's wrong with you. You find wrong with what's wrong with the pastor. You don't like what the pastor says. I don't like how he preaches. He preaches too hard, but you don't, you, but you don't have no issues with your life. You have no issues how you are. Oh, but I don't like how he says things, but what about the way you say things? Well, I don't like that music. Well, what about the music you listen to outside of church? You see, we have to examine ourselves all the time. Oh, oh, I could preach better than that. Oh, I could have prayed better. I could have got that demon faster out than that person. But you're examining everybody else, but you don't examine yourself. Why? Because when you're constantly examining people, you show that you are a Pharisee. A Pharisee is constantly looking at what everybody else is doing. You notice that Pharisees were so busy examining Christ, but never examined themselves. So they examined the life of Jesus to see whatever he was doing wrong. But when, they, but they don't realize that they were examining God and trying to find faults and things wrong with the son of God, Jesus Christ. And, and, and all these different things. Yes, it's signs of a critical spirit. So signs you have a Pharisee spirit. You shouldn't be doing that. Guys, I tell us to people all the time, I'm too busy running my race. I don't have time to be worrying about what nobody else is doing. <clears throat> I pray as a pastor, I'm supposed to view, look, pay attention to what's going on in the church. But if you're not a pastor, you're not a, you're, you're not in charge, you shouldn't be worried about what nobody else is doing. And if you're going to look at what somebody else is doing, pray for them. But at the end of the day, if you're looking for wrong, if you want to find what's wrong, you want to find out what should be better. If you notice that the person is always criticizing, well, I don't like this church. Well, they could be doing this better. Well, why don't you do it? <laughs> you won't. You, you don't, Obviously, you don't do it. You're not doing it. So you shouldn't be talking. So you should be examining yourself and saying, Lord Jesus, what is it about me that I could change? So think about it. If, if us as Christians, whether you've been a Christian five years, 10 years, 20 years, a hundred years, if we all were constantly examining ourselves, we wouldn't have that critical spirit in church. We wouldn't have that Pharisee spirit in church that's always talking bad about the church. There's people that I know that when they get together after church, I'm like, me and my wife look at each other, we're like, we know that when they get together, they're going to talk bad about the church. They're going to talk bad about the message, the preaching, and the service. And some people think that I don't know about it. I know about it. <laughs> so you, you, you 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 have to focus on examining yourself. Shouldn't be if anyone comes to you and say, "Hey man, well I don't like I don't like how Josh sang that song," or "Well I don't like how Brenda prayed for me." You should say, "Okay, well let's go talk to them and 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 show them how to do it." Then, since you know so much, teach them how to do it. Teach them how to do it since you have so much expertise. Let, let's let's see. But oh no no no, brother, I don't want you to say nothing. Okay then, then you're 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 just uh, you're just uh you're just a uh, a critic from the bleachers. <laughs> Right. It's like when you're translating, you want you want to you want to know how you find out when you're translating and a million people are telling you how to do it. But I guess if you hand them the mic to translate, they're going to freeze up. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna freeze up. That's why I said. People will see it's better just to stay quiet, examine yourself, focus yourself. <laughs> Amen. Freddie's I guess hand them the mic. Right.
And it says, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this, for this reason, it says, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So we're, once again, it says that if you take the things of the Lord like a joke, you end up sick. That's why you've seen, I've seen some pastors end up sick. I've seen some people in church and ministry end up with diseases that you're like, how did they end up with that? Maybe they may be taking the things of the Lord as a joke and taking it lightly and God is punishing them. And he, and he says it here because they didn't discern, discern the Lord's body. It says many of them are weak and are sick. It says, but if we constantly were examining ourselves and judging ourselves, we don't have to worry about ourselves being judged. And it says, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned within the Lord. So it's good when God chastises us. Amen. If God chastises you or if God corrects you or God brings judgment on you, that's good. That means that it says here that you, so that you don't end up getting condemned. <laughs> what does condemned mean? Because this is the problem with a lot of Christians. They think that if they get corrected or rebuked, that they're being judged. Oh, I mean, or they're being condemned. I'm sorry. So the no, it's showing you judgment is good. You better hope that somebody comes and brings God's judgment on you, right? When when one man or God sends somebody to bring judgment on you, that's good because it's trying to prevent you from getting condemned. People think judgment means condemnation. I, I've heard people God, God has rebuked or corrected or God shows them what they're wrong, and someone goes, "Don't don't let the devil condemn you." That's not the devil condemning you. That's God bringing judgment and correction on you, so don't, that that you don't end up getting condemned. Someone's like, oh, man, I'm battling with a spirit of condemnation. Well, why are you battling a spirit of condemnation? Well, because I did this the other day. And, you know, this and that. No, that's God correcting you. You should feel bad about your sin. You should feel bad when you do something wrong. I know people who try to brush that off and say, well, I don't want a spirit of condemnation. Condemnation is means that you're going to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. That's condemnation. But being told what you're doing wrong is not condemnation. It's it's God bringing correction and judgment on you to prevent you from being condemned to hell. So how do you know you deal with a spirit of condemnation when a, when a spirit is constantly telling you you're going to hell, there's nothing you can do, you're not saved, that's condemnation. Anything else would be correction and judgment, and that's good. That is good so that a it, it, it Bible says that it's godly sorrow. Have anyone ever, when you've made a, a, a sin and you feel bad about it, there's godly sorrow. You feel bad about what you did. You don't want to do it again. You 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 should feel broken. Some people reject the brokenness because they say, "Well, I don't. I'm not going to let a spirit of condemnation do that." And that's not condemnation. You should feel broken because the same. I don't know. I feel like I need to stay on this topic because what happens? Some people will will do something, say something they shouldn't have done. They'll feel bad and they'll be like, "Well, I reject this. This is a spirit of condemnation." No, 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 no. You're broken about your sin. You need to stay, you need to be broken about it. You need to feel bad about it so you don't do it again. Because I've noticed people who try to reject a spirit of condemnation, thinking that's condemnation. What happens is they keep doing that sin over and over and over again because they're not broken about their sin, right? So you're supposed to feel broken about it. It's not condemnation. Condemnation is that you're doomed, you're, 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 you're always going to be like this and you're going to hell. That's condemnation, right? Justice says, so when some Christians preach about how we're all condemned with sin, is that a false teaching? Yes, because we're not condemned with sin. We're not cursed with sin. We have sin. We fall into sin, right? But it says, uh, what about when we are condemned with sin? Con con the definition of co condemned means you have been it's the final judgment. You're going to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. The only way a person is going to be condemned and we know it is if they fully walk away from Jesus Christ, they deny Jesus Christ, want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Yes, that person is showing signs that they're they're condemned. Right. But it's best that we don't make that judgment. Because that judgment is is got when people say, well, you shouldn't judge that. Well, that has, we are called to judge, but don't judge that because that's the final judgment. It's not our job to say who went to heaven or who went to hell, because the we can judge righteously, but we don't have final judgment, meaning we don't we weren't there to witness that person's final judgment to know if they went to hell or to heaven.
And, I, and so, Justin, if anyone is preaching that we're all condemned, uh, that's a false teaching. Condemned is anyone who's not in Christ. If you're in Christ and you messed up, you fail, you committed a sin, you're not condemned. You're redeemed <laughs> through Christ. God knows you're going to make mistakes. God knows you're going to sin. God knows you're going to you're going to do stupid things. And God knows that. Sorry, my headphone died. Hold on. So God knows that you have these things that you shouldn't do, right? But you're working on getting back up, getting restored, and doing these things. Now, like I said, if you choose to live a life of sin, if you choose to live a life, you know, of practicing it, you're condemning yourself. No one needs to even preach a word of condemnation. You've already condemned yourself. Does that answer your uh, your question, Justin? Amen. Let's keep reading. It says here, yeah, so verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So so who's condemned? Whoever's in the world. Whoever's in the world and who's not in Christ is already condemned. But it says here, us as Christians, God's going to bring judgment. God's going to chastise us. What does it mean, chastise? He's going to whip you. He's going to rebuke you. He's going to correct you. And and sometimes, how do we know? How we don't we know that being rebuked and corrected, it don't feel good. <laughs> Even Paul says it so many times that rebuke and correction, it never feels good, right? Nobody likes to be told what they're doing wrong. Nobody likes to be told where they're falling or failing or coming up short. But it's good because when you know where you're failing and falling, it should make you uncomfortable enough to say, hey, I'm going to correct this. So I can be where I need to be. Amen. The next chapter, probably my favorite chapter of first Corinthians spiritual gifts. Verse one, it says now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. <laughs> it says, however, you were led. <clears throat> Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and no one can say that jesus is lord except by the holy spirit so paul is letting us know right this is why you need the holy spirit because only somebody with the holy spirit is going to say that jesus christ is lord right and anyone with the holy spirit is not going to curse jesus that's what you notice people who uh, talk about blasphemy i've met christians who worry about blasphemy if you have the Holy Spirit and you live for Jesus, I, I highly doubt you commit blasphemy. Almost probably 99% of Christians I've met have all thought they've committed blasphemy. How many have ever, ever, ever fallen in the trap of thinking they've committed blasphemy? Well, it says here, therefore I may know to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. Um, the New King James Version. Verse four, it says there. Now he's going to talk about gifts. It says here, there are diversity of gifts. How, this is so important. I'm really going to elaborate on this because how many here you want, you want the spirit. You want the, you want the gifts of the Holy spirit. How many here on here tonight? You want to operate. You want to use, you want to have the gifts of the Holy spirit. The gifts of the Holy spirit are so important because people need it. People need that stuff. People think that this stuff's not important. There's a group of Christians called cessationists who think that these gifts are not active today. <laughs> I'm in the New King James Version. Dang, everybody's been asking what translation is. is what, what translation are you guys are reading from? Is it that different from what you guys are reading? NLT. Yeah, I'm in New King James. I was going to read in King James, the one, the thee, thy, thou, thou wist. I'm just playing. So now he's going to, he's going to put here diversity of gifts. Love you too, bro. It says here, diversity of gifts, meaning there's different types of gifts. It is so important, you that you're on here watching, that you understand that the Holy Spirit has a gift for you. 
and your gift may not look like somebody else's gift. That is why it's so important. You never covet somebody else's gift. Amen. Say, oh, I want I want their gift. How come they have that gift? I don't. You have a gift that is special. You have a gift that is meant to be used by you. Right. You have a gift. See, I, God has given me a gift of discernment. I'm able to cast out devils and demons. I pray for sick people. They get healed. Word of knowledge. I know things about things. That's good. But there's gifts that I don't operate in that somebody else, right, has a gift they can operate in. And that's good. I'm not supposed to have it or maybe operate in it. Why? Because I can't reach everybody, right? So if we all have the same gift, and and we all are missing the same gift, then we're not going to be able to reach certain people. There's certain people, guys, that you can reach, I can never reach. And there's people that I reach, right, that you can never reach. So it's so important that you understand that your gift is for you. You shouldn't be desiring to have anybody else's gifts. It says there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. And why this just came to my mind. Why should you not want nobody else's gift? Right? Because you might grab someone else's gift and they don't fit you. <laughs> right? You might say, dang, they got they got nice shoes, man. I wish I got that for Christmas. Well, if you grab their shoes, you put them on, it doesn't fit you. So now you're gonna be wearing something that doesn't fit you. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it's probably gonna fall off of you. If it's too big, it's gonna fall off. It's gonna be uncomfortable. It's probably gonna get creased up even worse you know so it's so that's why it's so important focus on your gift the gift that god has given you because the gifts that god has given you it fits you it fits you it's meant for the people that you are around the people you can reach right it says here there's diversity of gifts there are difference differences of ministries but the same lord and there are diversities of activities but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So why does God give you a gift? So it can benefit everyone else around you. The gift is not to benefit you. The gift is to benefit everyone around you. There's people who want spiritual gifts, but they only want it to benefit them. Well, I want to cast out demons. Why? Because you want everybody to look at you and think you're spiritual. Well, I want word of knowledge and I want to be able to prophesy. Why? So everybody can run to you with their dreams and their visions. That goes to show that you, you're, you're in it for yourself. You should want it. So other people, why? So other people can get saved. The number one reason why God gives you a gift is so people can get saved. The number one and the only priority us as Christians is for people to get saved, for people to come to the knowledge and the truth of Jesus Christ, that they can turn away from their old lifestyle and get saved. And it says here, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. What does that mean? That you have a lot of wisdom. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I know people, you can go to college, you can get a degree and you can study and you could be a complete fool. I've met people who have gone to college, have gone to school, have gotten degrees. And I'm sorry, you are a complete fool and because only wisdom comes from God. There's people who study and they know things. They have knowledge, but they have no wisdom. Did you know that? That you can have knowledge and have no wisdom? Because there's people you can go to school, study all these things, but your life proves you have no wisdom. Wisdom is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It says to another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit, which is what the word of knowledge that God through the Holy Spirit, right? Will show you, uh, give you knowledge about something or somebody. You, you guys have seen me operate in that gift where a complete stranger has come to our church before and I pray for them and I know things about them and I'll pray for them and God shows me things about them. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the word of knowledge is not a guessing game. I know people who think they have word of knowledge, but you just you're just really good at reading body language and you're you play guessing games. That's not a word. That's not word of knowledge. Right. And God doesn't give you word of knowledge for things that are irrelevant to salvation. The only reason why God is giving you a word of knowledge for so the person gets saved. Right. So the person gets right with Christ. And it says here. Verse nine to another faith by the same spirit. 
So even having a lot of faith, have you ever met somebody who has a lot of faith, no matter what they go through? It's, 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 or, or, or someone that God puts through hardships. There's some of you right now. God will put you through a hardship because he wants to develop the gift of faith that you have so much faith and that it increases. That's why if you want the gift of faith, you better expect to go through some tough things because faith a Bible says comes through many different ways, comes through the hearing of the word, but also through trials and tribulations, because your faith only increases when everything against your faith happens before you. How many can say amen? How many are going through that right now that when you, you, how do you know you have faith when you get put in some difficult situations where you're left with nothing but faith? Amen. Where you're like, I have no choice but to believe in God and trust in God. And that's when God will increase your faith. I know personally, guys, God has put me in some situations where I'm like, I don't have no idea what's going to happen. Or better yet, I've been put in situations where I'm thinking like, this is all about to end. This is all going to come tumbling down on me. I don't, I don't, or you're in a position, I feel the Holy Spirit to say this. There's some of you that you're like, I don't even know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm ever going to get ahead. I don't know how I'm ever going to start this business. I don't know how I'm ever going to do this. I have no idea, Lord, how I'm going to make it to the next month or the next month. I don't know how I'm going to make it to the end of this year. Oh, I feel that of the spirit. Somebody said that to the Lord. You said, man, I don't even know how I'm going to make it to the end of the year. Some of you are dreading the end of this year. Some of you are dreading the holidays. And I, I felt this in my spirit. And as I just said that, there's some of you right now you're dreading even the end of the year. You think that around that time is going to be miserable, depressing, horrible, and rough. And as I'm saying this, I also feel the Holy Spirit is showing me some of you, the devil has been attacking your mind lately to make you feel that whatever it is you're going through right now is going to continue on all the way to December. It's not. It's not. I feel that of the Holy Ghost to say this to some of you. Some of you think like, man, Lord, this is what I'm going through. This you're you're picturing yourself going through this all the way to the end of the year. Stop. The Bible says a person without vision will perish. See, that's not the vision of God that God has for you. I want to encourage you right now. And I feel this of the Holy Spirit to say this because it's not just one of you that feels this. Praise God for Brenda. She said that was her last week. And there's there's more more than just her on here. There's more. I feel that of God right now. There's a couple of you like, man, you you keep envisioning a rough and tough, miserable rest of the end of the year of whatever condition you're in right now, that you're going to continue on like that all the way to the end of the year. You better right now where you're where you're at and say, I rebuke that in Jesus name where I'm at right now. I will not stay. Say that right now. Where I'm at, I will not stay. I want you to prophesy that actually right now. I just feel it of the Holy Spirit. Say, where I'm at right now, I will not stay. Man, I feel I feel the Holy Ghost all over this right now. Some of you are dreading, you, you feel stuck. You feel stuck. And it feels like God's not helping you get unstuck. There's a lot of you on here. There's nine of you on here. But the, I hear the Holy Spirit is telling me there's nine of you on here right now on this Zoom that you feel stuck. And when you think, when you hear the rest of the year, you just envision yourself in the same condition, in the same place. And you need to say right now, because there's power in the tongue to say, where I'm at right now, I will not stay. I will not stay there. I ain't going to stay in this bad financial place. I'm not going to stay jobless. I'm not going to stay homeless. I'm not going to stay without my promise. I am not going to stay here. Why? Why am I not going to stay there? Because God has called me to go from glory to glory. How many believe that? Say, God is calling me from glory to glory but the devil has been trying to lie to some of you on here and tell you 
that you're going to go from failure to failure, from worse to worse. And I'm telling you right now, I feel it so strong of the Holy Ghost. The end, I've been that some of you have been hearing the enemy's voice loud lately. Re reminding you, trying to make you feel like a failure, trying to make you feel like a loser, making you feel not wanted, making you feel that maybe there's you're doing something so horrible that that's why you ended up where you're at right now. How many could be honest and say that you've been hearing that voice lately? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going off of the Bible study because now I'm just, I know this is going to go on YouTube, but I don't care. How many can be honest and say that, that that's been you? I want you to put, yes, that's me. Brenda said, yes, that's me. Dennis, how many have been hearing that voice lately? Messing with you about the rest of your year and that the condition you're in is only going to get worse or it's, it's going to continue like that. And it feels like God is not going to do anything about it. And some of you have been discouraged because July ended and you said, what happened to the month of transition? You remember I said, July marks the beginning of transition. It marks the beginning of it. You think because July is over that that's it. God's not going to transition you or shift you. God's not limited to a month. You can't put God in no box. Come on, somebody. God works in seasons. I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight. God works in seasons. Transition is not over. It's not over. Man, I feel God, man. Woo, Jesus. It's not over, saith the Lord. I'm going to prophesy tonight. I was praying before Bible study. I've been praying for a lot of you guys lately because your battles are my battles. When you guys get discouraged, I can feel it. My wife will tell you there's days I'll be watching TV and this sadness will just will come upon me and this brokenness will come upon me and I'll just put my head down. I'm going to cut this live. So we'll, uh, we're going to continue this Bible study next Thursday. I'm going to cut this live because I, I don't want I don't like putting people's personal business out there. So YouTube, see you next time.